reason we stopped here is because in 1984 I got dropped off here to start a, a solo survival course. I was a bit more lonely in 1984 and uh, this creek just here, this, that thing there is where I started. So the guy dropped me off, it's about a kilometre from the Millstream turn off and then I walked through the Chichester Ranges and then from here to the first water hole is 14 kilometres and then followed the gorges down and there's permanent water holes marked on the gorges and then came out the other side of the Chichester Ranges and then went to Windmill, Windmill, Waterhole, Windmill, Windmill, then onto the Sherlock River and then followed that big pools down until I got to the Sherlock Homestead which was 162 k's away. And I haven't, been, I haven't actually stopped here since then. Um, with a group of people. Um, there was a funny feeling, and you probably get that feeling towards the beginning of it, where you wonder what's going to happen next. But it was without a backup, so it was, um, I made the survival kit up and it's small enough to fit in a blue soap container, just a bit smaller than one you've got. And took all my clothes off, got the guy that dropped me off to search them all so had nothing hidden away. And the maps, and dressed similarly to the way Royce is. And I took off. But what I did was, I think was sensible, it was about this time of the day and I thought 14 kilometres would be dark before I get to the water hole. I'll wait till the morning. So I walked up and down the road and picked up an empty beer can and, and flagging tape and other things that I thought I might be able to use. And then took off at 4 o'clock in the morning to get to the water hole. Which was um, yeah, quite daunting, I thought. I remember just sat the other side of the railway line and there wasn't as many trains as there are now. I don't think there was one at night time. And I waited till I could just see, which is going to be my advice for you on this walk as well, on your walk. As soon as you can see, start walking in the morning when it's cool. I didn't have a mini torch, didn't have a head torch, they weren't invented then. <laughs> mini torches weren't available. Um, didn't have a torch at all. No radio, no sat phone, no backup. God tried to talk me out of it, didn't. And then he drove off. I remember sitting here like this, going, I'm back. <laughs> I think I want to change my mind. <laughs> Quite real. And that day it was 40, 40 grand. Mm. What time of year did you October. do? October. October, yeah. Got hit with the heat wave. Mm. And the people on the station said I couldn't do it because I was from Perth. And what would I know, you know, if I was from Perth? Mm. They had bets that I wouldn't make it. And, uh, but I did walk a lot at night. Once I got out of the gorges, I walked at night time. We'll give you that experience as well. One of the nights, we do a couple of kilometres down a track. Walking at night is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Particularly when it's cold. As soon as you start walking, you get warm. And some people have died recently because and one guy said, oh, he was stranded with his wife near Walloon. I said, I'll wait until sunrise and walk to the road. He should have said, I'll wait till sunset and walk to the road. And he died two kilometres short of dehydration. If you walked at night time, you would have made it. Because mm. you drink half as much as you do during the daytime. Half as much. And shade equals water. Mm. Remember that every time you stop, that shade equals water. If you stay in the shade all day, it would be equivalent to at least two litres of water that you don't sweat out or have anything. And just keep hydrated. That's one of the killers is hydrate, dehydration. And we don't even realise we're doing it. We should be drinking while we're around the base camp for three to four litres a day. So at least three litres a day. And that's perspiration. You know, respiration, breathe, we breathe out point over a litre a day out of our lungs and then urination. So you get three ways of losing it. Your feet sweat a cup of water over a cup of water a day each foot. <laughs> let alone your lungs and your body's got three million sweat pores, you've only do one drop each, that's a lot of sweat. And that's there to cool you down. So all the mistakes that I've seen made are usually related to heat illness. From headaches, vomiting, feet getting hot, sore spots on your body. And my walking plan was to walk for 40 minutes and rest for 10, which I'll advise you to do as well. So most people, if they think about walking, they're, they're stranded and they're going to leave the vehicle and walk to help, or, which is cost the lives of many people. I can guarantee they didn't have a walking plan. If they did, they wouldn't have left. <laughs> it's like the, um, I'm going to walk 37 to, to 
kilometres to the homestead and get help or get myself out of the situation. How many people have walked 37 kilometres in the straight line before on the track? And then usually the last one I'm thinking about is a truck driver and he wouldn't even wear a walking shoe. Probably wear elastic sided boots on. What do you take out of the first aid kit just in case? Nothing. Two litres of water and if you think about walking three k's an hour, it's going to take you um, 12 hours to walk there. Seven people last year died in WA Northern Territory from dehydration. Leaving vehicles and going for walks without enough water. If you're not feeling well, just mention it. So the group, you've got to be really honest about how you feel, particularly in a group. You go, I don't feel very well, I've got a headache. And that means you're probably got, you're not drinking enough. And I've said that to some guys that have come up to me and said, I've got a headache. They said, you haven't drunk enough. And the guy said, I've drank two litres. I said, yeah, I didn't say that. He said, you haven't drunk enough for what you're sweating out, urinating out, breathing out. You haven't drank enough. You've got to drink some more. Usually followed by a projectile vomit. That was the last one that hit me in the boots. So I said to this girl, you don't look well. She said, I'm all right. Said, no, you're not. And she was her ego, because she was a tour coach, tour guide leader. And she this big projectile vomit on so I thought it went well. <laughs> and then that's the time to relinquish your, your gear and say, can you carry my, my belt for me? Can you carry my day pack for me? Or you're a burden to the group. And I had to keep a, a check on myself all the time that I didn't overheat and then stop and have the discipline to stop every 40 minutes. It sounds crazy that you're just, if you're going to do 100 Ks, you stop every two Ks. But when I finished it, I actually went mustering on a motorbike the next day with the station manager, the station owner. He said, oh, well, we're going to have to muster some feet, Bob, you want to come in? He'd forgotten that I'd just walked under him 62 kilometres. I said, yeah, yeah, no worries. And he said, halfway through the day, he went, hang on, you've just, <laughs> you've come from over there somewhere. He said, yeah, and you better wouldn't make it. I'm going to chewing your sheep along now. So I had to wait for somebody to come pick me up. So if you do it in those short increments, just like I just imagine climbing Mount Everest in the old days, you wouldn't climb up from the sea to summit, which that guy did, he did it in, in steps. And plans don't fail, it's a fail to plan something. And it's a mind game. If we went around now and said, what are you most scared of? You find out everyone's scared of something different. It depends on how you've been brought up for what you're scared of. And that can, you're not worried about sharks and crocodiles. <laughs> But um, if you're a failure, when it's your turn to be a leader for a half a day, the fear of that. And those sorts of things, you'll find out more about yourself. Than quite a lot um, of the finer sand is, is good for sandpaper, then finer and finer and finer, even down to charcoal. And the different types of woods that are here for cooking on. Everything's something, nothing's something. And you'll, you'll learn that too as you go along. That there's soft ground and hard ground. You want to sleep on the soft stuff, <laughs> you know, but you'll end up, you'll, I'll guarantee you, you'll sleep on something rougher than that. For a 10 minute breaks after a couple of, everyone starts to, oh not that, I'm not sitting on that, and then next thing, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> 10 minute break, you're actually asleep. So yeah, for 1984, I sat here by myself, just like you guys, wondering what's going to happen tomorrow.